Almighty God, grant we beseech you that the words that we will hear this day with our outward ears may through your grace be held inwardly in our hearts that they may bring bring forth in all the fruit of good living to the honor and praise of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our scripture today is from Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. A future with hope. Sometimes that's hard to remember. We are back in the sanctuary, and yet we also feel a bit like we are in diaspora. Many of the congregation, more than half of the people assembled on any given Sunday, join us online. And we are so glad to have you. We are so glad to have you. It's wonderful to be able to occasionally see Doug in Florida, or sometimes Jim and Susan in North Carolina, Bob and Louise in Annapolis, Beverly Siri in Colorado or New Mexico, Joellen in Pennsylvania, Kathy in Minnesota, Jay in Illinois. And it's wonderful that those of us that are a little closer in can join online, protecting ourselves from exposure to harmful germs, unable to drive anymore maybe, but still able to come to worship, even joining us while recovering from surgery or illness or injury. It's amazing and it still feels a little bit like diaspora. I'll own that I wish that we could all be together again in the same place. For me, it would actually be the very first time. Oh, how I wish that we could do that. But that is my dream, and not necessarily God's dream. Jeremiah writes, just before we wrote in the writes just before the excerpt that we read a minute ago in verses 8 and 9. Do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to your own dreams that you dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. Now, I don't believe for a minute that God calls the COVID pandemic, but I do believe that God can use the pandemic and its effect on our lives to help spread God's love far and wide. What God says to the Babylonians in exile in verse 5 is, God also says to us, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Now, this is not what you would normally do when you're in exile. You would expect to be beckoned home at any minute. You would not think about buying a house, certainly not in this housing market. And you might not even think about planting a garden because, you know, that would take some time. 
to really come to fruition. And what God says is, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. And beloved, we have. In 2020, we immediately moved to online worship only. The more that we did it, the better we got at it, and the more comfortable that we became with it. When we reopened our building in September of 2021, and after discussing it as a congregation, we moved to hybrid worship, Zoom and in person. This was by far the hardest of the five options we entertained. Live streaming would have been much easier, but we chose hybrid because we wanted, we valued interacting as a congregation during worship, greeting one another at the beginning and at the end, passing the peace, sharing our prayers, having worship leaders who aren't even in the building. And because God led us to this, we've had more folks join us even people we've never met in person, like Joellen's niece, Kathy, in Minnesota. We are so glad you're here, Kathy. Since returning to the building, we have been able to have fellowship hour after worship just about every week. And since this last June, we've been able to do about one large gathering a month. We can do this because our partner church, Fountain of Mercy, has graciously been willing to set up and take down tables in the social hall, and because we've been purchasing main meal items from, from local restaurants, rather than asking everybody to bring something, since we usually are about 30. It's a little different than it used to be, but it is no less wonderful. We were courageous enough to take out five pews on either side of the sanctuary and try flexible seating to help us embrace being a smaller congregation. And we created a playground for our little people to be able to see everything that's going on in worship, to participate as they can. Hello, Owen's waving over there. He's not such a little person, but he takes it. Yes, you are. Okay, yes, he is, he says to participate as they're able, and to feel welcomed in worship just exactly as they are, which honestly is all any of us ever wants, right? And just recently, we made a modest investment in hybrid gatherings beyond worship by removing old bookshelves in the library, repairing and, repaint and painting the wall, hanging a large 85-inch television screen bigger than this one, and purchasing an owl, this fantastic device that has a microphone for a larger space and can take a panoramic view of the, of the room and also is smart enough to identify who's speaking when and highlight that on a screen. It is we have used it for deacons, we have used it for Bible study, and I think Presbyterian women are gonna use it today. It's fantastic to see what God is giving us the courage to do here. God's faithfulness isn't new here though, right? We've known it and seen it for a while now, even if sometimes we forget. When this congregation decided in the 1950s that the building it had worshipped in for 60 years wasn't suitable any longer, we raised the money to build something completely new, leveling what we had and starting over. The only things we have from that building are those two sanctuary windows at the backs, two stained glass windows, this communion table, maybe a few other small items. As recently as the 1980s, we weren't air conditioned, but when someone finally decided that they were tired of the 17 year cicadas flying around in worship, which they got it done, you know, which honestly I can see why any sort of memory of the plagues of the 10 plagues, right, might be something you'd want to eliminate on a Sunday morning. In 1990, we organized and purchased a new organ. 
to enhance our worship life. And just within the last 10 years, we've held a capital campaign for an elevator, handicap accessible entrances, and a restroom. And by the grace of God, we paid off that loan early. Hybrid worship might not seem as big as an elevator tower, but it is. If the elevator makes the building accessible to everyone who comes to it, hybrid technology makes worship and meetings and classes and retreats and gatherings accessible to everyone who comes to the building and everybody who doesn't. It makes Warner's particular brand of God's love accessible to the world. That's why our sermons are going up on YouTube now. And hopefully we'll have a digital ministry coordinator soon who can make sure that they are also available regularly as podcasts, who can curate our Facebook page and our brand new Instagram account, who can modify the new website we hope to have soon so that we can share God's love and feed those who are hungry for it, who are hungry for God's love wherever they may be. And for the people that we know and love who live locally, it's why we hope to have a minister of congregational care who can regularly visit not just the homebound folks, but the at-home folks. Someone who could host a grief support or caregiver support group, who could do the work that Reverend Bruce Bowen used to do when he was our parish associate. And Bruce, if you and I are honest, you still kind of do some of that. who could help us care for one another even more deeply. Sometimes, though, it's tricky to trust God, even if we believe in God, even if we know that God has shown up for us as a congregation and as individuals time and time and time again. We're human. We like to be in control of our own lives. We're Presbyterian, for Pete's sake. We like to have uh, directions about how it's going. Unless you think that pastors somehow have an easy button for this, I'm here to tell you we do not. I have a close friend who is also a pastor, and by her own admission, she has trouble trusting God. She likes to have a plan, to know the plan, to be prepared, and for it to go at her preferred speed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you do. I do. Anyway, let me be clear to say that I am sharing both that and the bit I'm going to share in just a second with her permission, even, in fact, at her suggestion. A little bit more than a week ago, she was in a serious car accident. She's okay, mostly. Treated at the hospital and released. No major injuries, thank God, though her car was totaled. She was on her way to the hospital to visit a parishioner. Here's how she says God showed up for her. In the sister of a congregant who's a registered nurse who happened to be driving by and stopped at the scene of the accident to see if she could help. In another congregant who then immediately went to see the hospitalized parishioner so they would not be alone in the friend that took her to the rental car company so she'd have something to drive, even if she had some trepidation about getting behind the wheel again. In the congregants who have surrounded her with love and prayers and food. In the senior pastor who told her to take the week off, which it would never have occurred to her to do. This is how God has shown up for her in the last week or so. Now, she is still concerned about how she'll find a new car, if she can get the same interest rate she had last February when she bought that brand new car, what her insurance will cover, how her back and her shoulders will heal. But she's trying really hard to let that go and believe that God has a future with hope for her, too. Here's the last thing I'll say. As Christians, 
Do you know why it is that we have hope? Because of Jesus Christ. As Paul writes in the first letter to the Thessalonians, quote, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. We do not grieve as others do, with no hope. It doesn't mean we don't grieve. It means death is not the end of the story. Death doesn't win. We know this through Jesus, whose reign we celebrate on Christ the King Sunday today, which is the end of a liturgical year. Even as our year ends, even as we face death, even as we deal with change we neither wanted nor needed nor hoped for, we have hope. A future with hope, promised in Jeremiah, reminded of in Paul's letters, revealed in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.